I want to read from John chapter 4, verse 35, and we're talking about the harvest, what Jesus called the harvest. I shared last week, you can get that and, and, and take a look at that. John chapter 4, starting in verse 35, do not say, this is Jesus speaking, do not say there are still four months and then comes harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white. They're already white, already ripe for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages. That's what we're doing. We are all the time considering how to pull people in. They receive wages and gather fruit for what? eternal life, the importance of what we do, that both he who sows, listen to this, he who sows, both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this, the saying is true. <clears throat> and Jesus is quoting the Bible here, the, the writings in the Old Testament, one sows and another reaps, unquote. One sows and another reaps. He goes on to say, I sent you, he says, I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Wow. Do you see what I see there? Some of the reaping we do has not even been our effort to bring it about. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the clarity of your word and how it orients us and corrects us, instructs us in the things you want us to know. And use it today and every word that I say today for the heart of Jesus to be imparted in your people. I ask in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. So today I'm going to teach you what Jesus said about the harvest, even more than what I did last week. And I'm going to ask you as disciples of Christ or future disciples of Christ to do and say only what Jesus asks us to say and do concerning the harvest. That's all. So there's, there's a key, and I want you to remember throughout this message that this is about doing and saying what Jesus said about the harvest, thinking the way he wants us to think about the harvest. Now, these are not hard things, as we just read here. These are not hard things for you and I to do, but they are necessary if we are going to gain the heart of Jesus and gain the heart for his harvest that he wants us to have because we don't have it naturally. And so he wants to impart that to us. These things that he wants us to say and do and think are not one and done kind of things. They're not one and done and, you know, just move on and forget about it. No, these are things that we should seek to think about and do and say about the harvest on a daily or a fairly frequent basis. And so it's vital that we have, you and I, have the perspective and the heart of Jesus about his harvest. And listen, there's two parts, not only having his perspective about the harvest, but discard our ideas about the harvest if they're not lined with his. And so we have to discard some things when we're looking at the harvest. This is what Jesus is teaching here. All of it is in the words that I just shared. Why should we discard a lot that we say and do and think about the harvest? Because, listen, our perspective about people, remember the harvest is people, our perspective about people can be tainted. It can be skewed. 
by our hurts and by our wounds, our insecurities, our pasts. It can be skewed by people who have hurt us, who have said negative things about us. And so it can be skewed by bias in our lives. And so it's important that we gain the perspective of Jesus about the harvest as he declares it and discard a lot of our own thinking and the way we think about the harvest. Because if we don't, we may never actually participate in the way that he wants us to in the lives of others. We become ineffective, in other words, if we don't adopt fully what Jesus is saying and how he wants us to perceive and to speak and to work in his harvest. Therefore, let's learn. Amen? Everybody say, let's learn. Look at your neighbor and say, let's learn what Jesus taught his disciples to do and say and think about the harvest. Amen? Why not? Why not? We're disciples or future disciples and say, so why not? And so, and then I asked the question, why is this important? Well, let me just say this, because this is vital when you have to, when you look at the harvest and you understand what our, our goals are here and what Jesus wants to impart to us. See, when you humbly do what Jesus teaches in any area of life, whether it's tithing or serving or whatever, and when it comes to the harvest, absolutely. When you humbly do what Jesus is teaching, here's what the Spirit of God will do. The Spirit of God will go to work in you and open doors for you to be an influencer. He'll motivate you to want to influence. How many have heard of influencers today? Uh, my, you know, uh, I, I know of people who are influencers and they, they, you know, they sell products and they do things online. Well, Jesus wants us to be influencers for him. And so when we humbly do what he's teaching, the spirit of God begins to go to work. If we'll just do what he says, the spirit of God empowers us, in other words. He empowers us. He will go to work to open doors for us to be influencers for Christ. He will begin, the spirit of God will, to lead your steps every day to be in the right place at the right time, to say the right things, and to speak. He will give you the words, many times powerful words, like Kim's, Kim Wetland's prayers. He was just praying. He spoke the word of God over this little boy, and this little boy is raised up, and we're going to pray that he has no more sign of leukemia ever again in his life. Somebody say amen. But the Holy Spirit empowers us. See, that was him stepping into the harvest. That was him stepping into the harvest. And the Holy Spirit, when we do and say what Jesus is teaching about the harvest, he will give you not only the words that bring impact to others, and his word does not return void, right? It always brings forth fruit, but he will empower, motivate you to be one of the few. Remember, Jesus said the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. And so we want to be some of the few, right? And so he will make us, he will help us become one of the few who reap with him in the harvest. And so, let's look at it. Let's look at what Jesus taught about the harvest. For disciples and future disciples, number one, here we go. I'm going to give you four points today. Aren't you glad it's not eight? Hallelujah. Some of you wish it was. Hallelujah. You'd be here all day. Number one, do not say, he says, He says to you and I, do not say there are still four months and then comes harvest. Do not say there are still four months and then comes harvest. By the way, my notes are on the back table right back there in the corner. There's some three ring binders every week, every Wednesday, every Sunday. My notes are back there. You can get them, keep them, and continue to grow. Why did Jesus say that? Do not say there are still four months and then comes harvest. Let me explain. There are certain things, listen, there are certain things Jesus does not want you to say about the harvest. Did you know that? There are certain things that Jesus does not want you to say about people. 
Somebody say amen. There are certain things that Jesus does not want to come out of your mouth or out of your heart concerning people. And a lot of, some of us have some correction to do, right? Which implies that there are certain things that you should say about the harvest, and Jesus gives us that. And so what you say about something, anything, you name it, and especially the harvest in this case, since we're learning about the harvest and what Jesus taught, what you say about something influences not only your direction and your vision in your life, but the direction and vision of others around you. What if I came in here every, you know, every Sunday and said, you know, the harvest is great. The labors are few. Let's just throw up our hands and let's just, you know, let's just have a party. And Jesus is coming. The rapture's coming. And let's just forget about it. No, you would, you would, there wouldn't be anybody in this place. Come on. I would never say that. Your words are powerful. Look at your neighbor say, your words are powerful. And so when you say something about someone else, you are forming an opinion. And opinions become strongholds. And strongholds sometimes become unmovable. And so you have to watch what you say. Your words create your reality. Your words create your reality, whether it's, whether it's true or not. People walk in a, in a bubble in their life not even knowing what God is saying because they create their own reality with their words. And so when Jesus says, do not say certain things about the harvest, that's what he's meaning. He really says, don't say it because it, it, your words form your opinion and it forms your motivation many times. That's why it's important to correct what comes out of your mouth. If something comes out wrong or something isn't right and you're convicted, you say, I am sorry, Lord, I should not have said that. I don't care if you're the only one in the room. I'm about to speak in tongues right now, and I will interpret it because that's powerful. You are saying things in the presence of God every single day, every single second of every day of your life, and the Lord is hearing you, and so... You have to correct if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, especially the harvest. In this instance, Jesus did not want His disciples speaking words of what? Procrastination about the harvest. Why? Because the harvest would never be reaped. It would never be if it's always four months off. See, last week we established what? That the harvest is everywhere you are every single day that you live. I had an amen and, a, and an amen here. Everybody say amen. 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 All right. And so a disciple of Christ must speak about the harvest in the present tense. That's what Jesus is saying, at least partly what he's saying. And since God's heart and gentle urgency about the harvest. Sensing God's gentle urgency about the harvest. See, in this chapter, Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well, Jacob's well. Remember, Jesus was there. His disciples had gone to get food. Jesus was there by himself. The woman at the well came up, and she was a Samaritan woman. And Jesus began to engage her in conversation about her life and her need for Messiah. As we all need Messiah, as, and Jesus was speaking of himself, of course. And, and so this woman is just kind of going along with it and, and sensing some things deep in her heart. You can read the story. I'll not go into it, but it's powerful. And I'm going to refer to it throughout this message until I close here in a moment. But the disciples, see, Jesus stepped into this, Samaritan's woman, this Samaritan woman's life. But his disciples would have never spoken to that woman. Never would have spoken to that woman about the things that Jesus was speaking uh, to this woman about concerning Messiah and her need. 
And they were shocked. They were shocked that Jesus was speaking to this woman. And Jesus, Jesus turned them around as this woman left and she went back into the city of Samaria and she started talking to everybody and bringing people out. Jesus stayed two more days and preached the gospel to the Samaritans. And who knows the teachings there and healings there. The Bible doesn't record that, but it's powerful to think about. And so Jesus turned them around, turned the disciples around about what the harvest is in this case and when the harvest is to be reaped and what to say about the harvest. Remember, the harvest is everywhere you are every single day of your life. So here's the point to point number one. Do not say words about the harvest that justify procrastination. Everybody say procrastination. What does procrastination mean? How many do not know? No, don't say. It just means delay, 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 delay. And not look at yeah, excuses and cause you to miss the opportunities to reap the harvest where you are or plant the seed in the field where you are in the hearts and lives of others where you are Every single day. Remember the Holy Spirit, when you start saying things and speaking things and believing things about the harvest that Jesus says and does and that he imparts, he will begin to go to work. He will go to work for you and he will open doors. He will open your mouth. He will give you opportunities. Number two. Everybody say number two. What Jesus taught about the harvest. Jesus said, not only don't say certain things, but then he says this. The fields are already white for harvest. This, this applies to the principle that I've been sharing. It's everywhere, every day, everywhere, every day. And so to advance in your effectiveness to reap in the harvest with Jesus. And by the way, we learned last week that the harvest has sick people in it. And so guess what? You pray for the sick. Amen? Amen. And that, that brings people closer to Jesus. Why? Because, or it helps them believe in Jesus because you're praying in Jesus' name. And you're sharing the good news when you pray for the sick and they get healed. Or delivering the captives. Saving the lost. This is all reaping in the harvest field. Planting seeds. Sharing the good news. Bringing others. This is the harvest. Bringing others safely home into the family of God. To advance your effectiveness in reaping the harvest with Jesus, you and I must not, not only refrain from saying negative things about the harvest, but work to say positive, proactive things about the harvest. Somebody say amen. Your harvest field, listen, every one of us have it. We all have a harvest field, and combined, it's even a bigger harvest field, right? Your harvest field is not only going to yield opportunities. This is what Jesus is saying. It's not only going to yield opportunities for you to share and lead others to Christ in the future. It is yielding opportunities today. Everybody say today. Right now, you have an opportunity to pour into these young people who are going to camp. 14, 15 kids who are going to be impacted for the rest of their life. What is $25? What is $10? What is $5 to get them there? I'm going to tell you, remember last week, Kayla Amlung and Adam, they were, she was a youth here years ago, Kayla was, and now she's a missionary to Thailand. Somebody shout Amen. The harvest is all around us every day. It's here in this place. These children are a harvest. Your children are a harvest. Your friends, your neighbors. Listen, the Lord wants us to speak those things and say those things that put the Holy Spirit to work in us to help Reap the harvest through us. Your harvest is yielding opportunities today as you plant and as you pray and as you move forward. Jesus wants his disciples to declare, to say, declare, and to speak the, that the, about the harvest 
as it is. Everybody say, as it is. And as he sees it, not as you see it, not as, not as I see it, I am to empty myself. I am to become, if you will, dead to certain things that I want, and I want to replace it with his will. And so I want to see what he sees about the harvest. And what does he see? It's already ripe. Somebody say amen. It's already ripe. And so there's this gentle urgency that the Holy Spirit begins to work in us. This is not a condemning thing. This is not a forceful thing. This is something that we become in his presence. We become fishers of men. You see, the woman at the well, let me refer to her again, was broken. I mean, she was broken and wounded. Now, she didn't show all of that. She was helpless and hopeless when Jesus stepped into her life. And she was putting up a big front, I'm sure, just like everyone else. And the disciples did not see what Jesus saw. And how many people around you and me today are like this Samaritan woman who's broken and wounded and helpless and hopeless and waiting for you and I to take a moment and share God's love and God's plan for their life. How many? Just think about it. And so you're asking the Holy Spirit now to give you opportunity. When you leave here today, God, give me opportunity. Give me opportunity. Everyone should take opportunity to pray for the harvest. Jesus said, remember last week, pray, Lord of the harvest. And he is Lord of the harvest. And so the harvest is already ripe. And it's been ripe. That's what Jesus is meaning here. It's already ripe. It's been ripe. It'll be ripe when you wake up in the morning. It'll be ripe next month. It'll be ripe all the time. The question is, will you say the things Jesus wants you to say to correct whatever is in your heart and mind about the harvest and avoid what he does not want you to say about the harvest? Why? Because your words are powerful. They form your opinion. You cannot afford, you and I cannot afford to see anything about the harvest that Jesus does not want us to see about the harvest. And this allows the Holy Spirit to partner with us, just not use us. People don't like the word use, but I like the word partner. Partner with us and empower us today. Number three. Everybody say number three. I got two more. All right. I know it's 12 o'clock, but hold on. What Jesus taught about the harvest. Number three. This is what he said. This is what he said, what we just read. And you can, you can miss these nuances. And this is what preaching is for. When you just read it, you miss things. And hearing the word of God preached is so important. So this is what Jesus said. Number three, Jesus said, do this. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, do this. And what did he say? Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. All right? So what is he saying by this? See, it's not only vital that we say the things, think the things that Jesus wants us to say and think about the harvest, but it is vital that we see the harvest the way Jesus sees it. Because when we look out there, and you know what's happening this month, there are people celebrating uh, perversion. It's just celebration of perversion, and it should never be, be taking place. You know, people can live their life the way they should live or the way they want to live, but right is right and wrong and wrong is wrong in the sight of God. And we're not here to, to uh, share anything except for the Word of God. How many understand what I'm saying? And we got to love people right where they are. Somebody say amen because that could have been some of us, right? And so... Lift up your eyes, Jesus says. Just look. And see, when you see people for their brokenness, we shouldn't see people through pride or through arrogance or through their sin. We have to see people in and through the eyes of Jesus. Come on. Open your eyes, Jesus is saying. Lift up your eyes. Open them. Don't see what they're doing. See what they're needing. And when you do, when you open your eyes, the Holy Spirit will open your heart. 
the Holy Spirit will open your heart. See, the way you see people is very important to Jesus. If you see people through the lens of bias and bigotry, and this happens across the board. This isn't just about a certain sector. This is about everyone that doesn't look like me. This is about everyone that doesn't act like me. And Jesus doesn't want us to view people and see people through the lens of how we perceive things and perceive them. He wants us to see them through his eyes, through cultural differences, that'll skew you. Through political differences, socioeconomic differences, all of those things will hinder us in the work of Jesus and make us, render us ineffective in his harvest. So I know we have this precarious place. We have to stand for what's right, but we stand for what's right and what's truth in love. Everybody say truth in love. How many understand humility is boldness as well, that we stand in love. We're not going to back off of what God says. Somebody say amen. This is very important. We learned about humility on Wednesday night. You should come to our Wednesday night services. They're powerful. They're very, very powerful. We're speaking through the book of Romans. It's something you should hear. Uh, so anyway, let me, let me finish this point, point number three. The Samaritans were despised. They were despised by who? The Jewish leaders and avoided by the people because the Jewish leaders influenced the people. And so they they couldn't make friends. They couldn't influence them when God didn't want that. God never intended that to be that way. So Jesus came to break down the barriers, right? And so the disciples, the disciples of Jesus on this day where Jesus was at the well, saw the woman, talked to the woman, the disciples that Jesus had were still in the mindset of bias and exclusionism. And so you and I must never be caught in the web of bias and exclusionism. Somebody say amen. Lost souls, listen, and you and I were out there. We were the harvest, remember? And here we are safely in. But lost souls are being deceived and influenced by their sin right now. But Jesus loves them. And sees them not for what they do only, but what they need. And you and I must not be deceived and influenced by our bias, our sin, our old nature, and our old mindset. You see, the lost and deceived must know you love them through Christ. They must know that. And you don't have to condemn what they do. When I was getting... Uh, the gospel, my brother Jerry sitting up here and his, his wife Anita when I was a teenager, you know, <clears throat> they were loving me where I was, but they loved me enough to help me move on and get forgiveness and be saved. Somebody say amen. So they, the lost and deceived must know your love for them through Christ and your desire for them to be saved by Christ. Your desire for them to be saved. So lift up your eyes. Everybody say, say, lift up your eyes. Look. Just see. See through the eyes of Jesus. Jesus was weary that day. He was thirsty. you got to hear this. Please hear me. Hold on. Just stay with me here. Jesus was weary and thirsty at Jacob's well. He was tired, physically tired, the Bible says. He could have kept to himself when he saw the Samaritan woman at the well. But he looked at her and he perceived beyond his own weariness, he perceived her burden of sin and engaged her about God's answer to her burden of sin. So what am I saying? I'm saying lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes and look at people with the love, compassion, and power of Jesus, even when we are tired and weary. <clears throat> it will make a huge difference in your effectiveness to reap with Jesus from this point on in your walk with Jesus. Number four. Everybody say number four. Finally, pastor. All right. Number four, Jesus said this. What did Jesus teach about the harvest? This is what he said. 
And these are so powerful. I, I can't explain all of it, but I'll try to give you something. Jesus said, he who reaps receives wages or rewards. Somebody say amen. And gathers. He who reaps receives rewards. That's what we're doing here. Everybody say amen. And fruit for eternal life. That both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this, the saying is true. One sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. So what am I saying? What is Jesus saying? See, Jesus taught that together and as individuals, we must be prepared to sow and reap, or both, every day. Somebody say amen. That's how simple it is. Just We just got to be prepared. We got to be prepared. And so we are to combine, everybody say combine, our efforts in the harvest. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm not a boat out here trying to get everybody saved. Where would I take everybody that I got saved? To my house? Well, my house is limited. But we together can create a place where discipleship and worship and the word of God and the power of God and the fellowship of believers, that's what the church is all about. That's what Jesus is building. It's the in-gathering. It's the in-gathering of souls, of people. See, this is the importance of why we gather and who we are in Christ. I'm not only an individual, temple, and disciple of Christ. I am a part of the body of Christ. This is the importance of who we are. You have to understand the importance of the church. At one point, you and I were the harvest. Like I said, we were not gathered safely into the family of God. The family of God. That's what the church is. It is the family of God. Everybody say family. Someone from his church, that is the church of Jesus, or your past home church, or some other church, family, faithfully planted the word of God in your life. Planted the seed of God. You may not have liked it. You may have resisted it. But it got in there anyway. Hallelujah. I know you're tired, but just shout with me. Praise God. I'm excited about this part. you got to hear me. And so, then others came along, and you were resistant. That word was on some hard ground, but there's some good ground in there. And what happened? Somebody watered that seed. Somebody faithfully watered the seed, and it began to grow, and you began to understand some things. Your eyes began to open. You weren't saved yet, and God began to give the increase. And finally, he gave the increase so much in your life and in my life while we were out there in the harvest, not laboring, but we were the harvest, God began to increase a heart of repentance in us. There was a heart of repentance. Lord, I'm, I feel so, I don't like what I'm doing. I'm so, you know, and we begin to think about how God thinks about our sin. And then he gave us faith toward Christ and faith, not only repentance toward God, but faith in Christ to save us from our sin. Somehow, we didn't understand the blood of Jesus. We didn't understand the work of the Holy Spirit, but we were allowing God and God was working on us. We were out there. We were the harvest. Do you see what I'm saying? It's so important. Others invited us to church Maybe we gave our lives to Christ in church, but we found a church. And here we are, here we sit in the ingathering. We are the ingathered. Somebody say amen. We are the ones who have gathered in his name. Hallelujah. Who have been transformed by Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus is saying about the harvest. There are rewards. There are wages for the laborer. Now some people... I will never know the influence that I've had in their life until I get to heaven. But they know. They know the influence that you've had in their life. I, some people will never know uh, what influence they were to, on me to give my life to Christ. But remember, one sows and another reaps. There is eternal wages. That is eternal life in the balance for so many. So here, here's what we do. We sow, we reap, we water. We continue to do this every day. God will give you the harvest of your family, of your loved ones, 
You will give us a harvest here. We will send out more seed. And, and we planted churches. We sent out missionaries. Somebody say amen. Here's how the Apostle Paul put it. Let me read this and I'll close. Come on up here, Tara. The Apostle Paul put this into words for the church. And this is so important. Remember, Paul went about establishing what? The church. Churches. In gathered souls, people who needed to be discipled, people who would take seriously the mission of Christ, people who would say yes to discipleship and learning and growing in signs, wonders, and miracles, learning the word and being a part of his body. Are, is it important to you? If you, if you want to understand uh, the importance, just look at the New Testament. This is what Paul says about the church, 1 Corinthians. It's not going to be up there, but just, just listen to what I say in chapter 3. Verse 5, starting there. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? These were ministers. But ministers through whom you believe, Corinthians, who you believed as the Lord gave to each one. Notice what Paul says. I love this. He's picking up on what Jesus said. He said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Ha <laughs> ha! So then neither he who plants is anything, right? We can't boast. Nor he who waters, but God. God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. Everybody say, we are one. We're not only individuals, but we are one. And this is what Jesus is saying. Each one will receive his reward according to his own labor. Did you know you're going to receive reward just for being a part of his church here? You are going to, you are going to receive reward because we take seriously the things of God. We're not here just to entertain and have flashing lights. I'd love to have flashing lights. One day we will. Hallelujah. We may have hazers and all kinds. I don't know, but we can't afford all that stuff. But I'm telling you this, we can afford hearing the word of God. And it can change us. Notice this. It's so powerful. Each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are God's fellow workers. Look at your neighbor and say, you are God's fellow worker. <laughs> you need to hear other people saying that to you. I know it makes you uncomfortable. Jesus said things that made people uncomfortable. So Jesus taught that together and as individuals, we must be prepared to sow or reap or both every day. And we combine our efforts. They multiply. Remember what the Bible says. One can put a thousand to flight. Two can put ten thousand. What does that mean? That means there, are, there, are multi, there is a multiplication, an exponential increase of fruitfulness when we cooperate together. How lonely is it for Christians not to have a home place, a home gathering. How lonely is it? It's very lonely. Let me answer it. So let me give you some concluding thoughts and I'll close. Everybody say, finally, lest we forget the harvest is people. You are around people every day. Even now you're around people. I am watering the word of God in your life so that you will bear more fruit right now. Somebody say, amen. Come on. Amen. Thank you, Kate. I am watering it. That is my job. It's just not my job. It's my vocation. It's my calling. But then also, listen, you have to know. You have to know where you are. You have, to, you have to live in the present tense. The harvest isn't out there four months. Yeah, maybe. No. Oh, no. Because you're always watering. You're always planting. You're always sowing. And sometimes you get to reap. Sometimes you get to reap. So do what Jesus wants you to do. 
Say what Jesus wants you to say. Listen, your words are so powerful. They are so powerful. You have to get past all of the toxicity of our nation right now. All of the toxicity. Get it out. Become laborers with Jesus. The harvest is reachable. I said it's reachable. It's all around you. The harvest needs labor. Stand with me. Bring those lights down, Steve, if you will. Are you ready to make a declaration? Now, when you say this, it's very similar to last week, but in this series, and there's going to be one more, so you've got to be here next week. Very, very powerful, I believe, unless the Lord does something different, and He does sometimes. I want you to make this declaration, but I want you to close your eyes when you do it, and I want you to say it to Jesus. I want you to say it to your Heavenly Father. And while we're saying this, I want our team to come forward and begin to set the prayer stations for us. Repeat this after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the revelation of Jesus Christ and the great harvest all around me. Thank you that when I consider your harvest and pray for your harvest, the Holy Spirit will go to work and bless me to reach your harvest. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for Life Church and other churches and leaders and congregations who are all about your mission to teach the Word of God, to pray for the sick, to reach the lost, to build your church. Equip me. Empower me. And give me your heart of generosity to give, to work, and to change my priorities and how I view people from this time forward for your praise and honor and glory I pray Amen Come on, let's give God praise right now Hallelujah Shake up the ground of all my tradition Break down the walls of all my religion Your way is better Your way is better Shake up the ground of all my tradition. 